Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Capera. I am the Park and Recreation Department Director for Middletown Township. I want to thank you all for coming here tonight. A couple of housekeeping uh, items first. We are recording this session so that we can put it on our website. What that means is that the uh, questions are going to be repeated, and at the end, when there's a lot of questions, you may see me running around all over the place with the microphone. The reason is just so your voice gets gets recorded properly, okay? Nothing, nothing nefarious. Uh, the other thing, I made the announcement before, if you need to go to the restroom, it's through that door basically behind this TV screen, okay? The um, couple things about tonight. So as it's going on, Think about this. We are fortunate that in this rain garden seminar, we have people outside of Middletown Township. We have some Yardley, some Doylestown, some Hatboro, Morrisville. It's fabulous. Everybody's coming from different regions, okay? Everybody's zoning is different. So what I mean by that is, let's say you just want, you have a 10,000 square foot property. You want to do a 250 square foot rain garden. Probably no issue but just plan it, call your zoning department, building and zoning, we call it here, some call it license and inspection, just make the call and have that plan, okay? The reason is, um, if you wanted to never mow your lawn again and take your one acre property and make it all natural gardenscape, it may be a violation of the zoning ordinance. So just check, that's all I'm saying, okay. So we're not gonna do anything zoning-wise, it's just gonna be a great, great session, question and answer. Uh, after this session, there are some handouts, some of you already got them, but basically absorb the knowledge, feel free to take anything that you want to go out, okay? Before I introduce Fred, I'm gonna come back at the end, okay, so we'll have a question and answer session, and then we'll, um, I'll close it up for the night, and if, you know, I hope you have a great time. So I'm gonna introduce Fred Lubno from Princeton Hydro. Princeton Hydro is on our radar screen because they've done some excellent work for, within county for clients, but also with the Bucks County Conservation District related to Lake Luxembourg and everything else like that. So I'm going to introduce Fred Lubno from Princeton Hydro. Thank you. All right, everyone can hear me? Good. Hello, everyone. My name is Fred Lubno. I'm with Princeton Hydro. I'm the Senior Technical Director of Ecological Services. I also teach a class at Del Val University on watershed management. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the students got to hear this presentation this afternoon, so um, this is the second time I'm running it. I just wanted to make sure uh, everything was running smoothly. So again, this presentation is on uh, rain gardens. I'll be focusing very briefly on the history of stormwater management, talking about structural BMPs. BMP stands for best management practice. I'll be talking about specifically what are rain gardens and how they provide ecosystem services and how that benefits us relative to water quantity and quality. And then I'll give some examples of some of the rain garden projects that we've been associated with. So just to give a very brief history of stormwater. Prior to the 1980s, stormwater, particularly in this part of the United States, was considered a nuisance. It's, we got to get the water off the roads. Um, we don't want flooding. We want to make sure that people are safe. We want to make sure the water's off the roads. So most stormwater structures were just designed to hold water temporarily while it slowly bled out into receiving waterways. Uh, now what happened was in the early 70s when the Clean Water Act um, was authorized, one of the first things the Clean Water Act focused on was point source pollution. And point source pollution is the pollution that comes from, say, a factory or a wastewater treatment system. It's a distinct pipe that's going into a stream or into a lake. So the Clean Water Act initially focused a lot on point source pollution, and there were a lot of improvements in water quality. But through the next decade, into the 80s, we realized, hey, there's another form of pollution, non-point source pollution, the stuff that flows over land, collects in, uh, um, in gullies and waterways, collects into stormwater pipes, and discharges. That's called non-point source pollution. So in 1987, um, the Clean Water Act was um, amended to include addressing 
this non-point source pollution. And then in the 90s, it was updated. I'm sure you, you may have heard of uh, MS4, which is an additional way of managing stormwater and non-point source pollution. So again, back in the 80s, mostly concerned about flooding. So we had these large basins. Um, so one of the first ways that stormwater was being managed from a quality perspective was to retrofit these basins. And you'll see as I go through here, you'll see that the focus went from just dealing with the quantity to dealing with quality, cleaning up the water. And a lot of this morphed into what's called green infrastructure. Rain gardens are a form of green infrastructure. And again, I'll be getting into that. And then into the future, you're going to see that a lot of watershed management and stormwater is going to focus on resiliency and connecting streams to floodplains and having these ecosystem services really improve uh, the water quality in our local communities. When we talk about stormwater management in terms of quality, there are essentially four ways stormwater is managed. Settling, so you slow the water down and the heavier particles settle out. Infiltration, you allow the water to go into the ground, recharging the groundwater, reducing that volume that's on the land. Chemically, the soil can bind for example, phosphorus sticks onto iron, sticks onto calcium, uh, sticks onto aluminum in soil. There's a chemical reaction. And then biological, you can have the microbes and the plants assimilating those pollutants. Four modes of stormwater treatment. There, the, the types of BMPs are broken down into various categories. I'm not going to get into them. I just want to identify, you can see Raiden Gardens are identified as a type of BMP that's going to deal with volume, peak rate reduction by infiltration. However, rain gardens are also great for improving the quality of the water as well. They remove a lot of nutrients. They remove a lot of solids. So here's a typical dry detention basin. These are the ones that were originally designed just to get the water off the roads, temporarily hold it, and let it bleed into receiving waterways does almost nothing for water quality. Um, uh, can uh, basically resuspend se sediments and go into receiving waterways and typically address large drainage areas. But the nice thing about these basins, they were sort of the low hanging fruit in stormwater management. We already had land that was designated for stormwater management. So um, it, one of the first ways of addressing stormwater was to convert these dry basins into these extended detention basins. And we've implemented a number of these in the Core Creek Lake uh, Luxembourg watershed. For example, Grain Nun Academy Basin. This was done about, I'd say, seven, eight years ago. Again, a large basin, really provided no water quality benefits. Um, it was, we redesigned it. You can see this little area here where you see that stone riprap, that's a forebay. So when the water comes in, it slows down, allows the solid particles to settle out. And then the water moves into all of this meadow area. So all those plants help to assimilate the pollutants. So we went from a basin that just temporarily holds water to a system that's allowing the solids to settle out and the dissolved pollutants to be assimilated by the plants. Uh, and then another example, Heather Ridge Basin. We did a number of the Heather Ridge um, uh, basins. This was one, again, before and after. And again, you can see up here in this upper area, that four bay, that little stilling basin, it allows the solids to settle out. It's easier to maintain. So when the, the Department of Public Works, instead of having to dredge out the whole basin, they only have to go out and remove the sediment from that area. So again, these basins relatively low in maintenance and can, re, can uh, accommodate a large amount of, of runoff, um, but they don't have high pollutant removal rates. They're good, but they're not great. Um, but they are providing ecosystem services, and this is how we're going to get into rain gardens. So rain gardens and a lot of these um, retrofitted basins provide what are called ecosystem services. These are valuable functions that um, nature provides. So for example, soils. They allow so a, a good, decent, loamy soil allows the water to get into the ground. It reduces the severity of erosion. The soil helps to remove some of those pollutants. Riparian vegetation. You know, putting vegetation along the edge of a stream or along the shoreline of a lake or pond cools that habitat, 
It also stabilizes it, reduces erosion, and provides food for the food web. And trees, I do want to spend a little bit of time on trees because trees are the workhorse when it comes to stormwater management. Um, trees are really valuable in terms of putting water back up into the atmosphere and putting water into the ground for our base flow. So they provide a lot of valuable ecosystem services. So for example, all the rain that falls on a tree canopy, 20% of that precipitation is retained by the canopy. One tree um, can reduce that volume of stormwater by about 4,000 gallons every year. So imagine a patch of trees. Once they're removed, they're no longer there to remove that water that either goes into the ground or back up into the atmosphere. So a forest of approximately 10,000 trees can retain approximately 10 million gallons of rainwater per year. So again, planting trees are really the way to go. And, and it's not just getting water into the ground. You can see an acre of Douglas, Douglas fir gases out 46 tons of water vapor over the course of one summer day. Approximately, you know, 5,500 gallons of water. It's a lot of water that when those trees are gone, that water has to go somewhere and it ends up becoming surface runoff, causing flooding, causing erosion, causing uh, mobilization of pollutants. And this is probably one of the most important slides. Like when I teach watershed management, this is one of the slides I come to time and again. If you look at a watershed where you have a naturalized system, where you have a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees, most of the water is going into the ground through infiltration, or it's going back up into the atmosphere through evaporation or transpiration. Transpiration is a biological activity where the trees put water back up into the atmosphere. So look at how much runoff there is, only 10%. Again, most of the water is recharging the groundwater or going up in the atmosphere. In contrast, you look at that very urbanized setting where you have very little infiltration, very little water going back up into the atmosphere. Where's that water going to go? It's going to be surface runoff. This is when we get the flooding. This is when we get the erosion. This is when we get the mobilization of pollutants. So the key is we're going to have, we're living in this watershed. What can we do to maximize in our life, maximize these ecosystem functions? And green infrastructure is really the way to do that. So the before I get into the green infrastructure, the last ecosystem service I do want to emphasize are these complex food webs. Again, providing vegetation along a stream bank or along a lake shore. It helps to provide um, habitat and refuge for fish. It helps to provide habitat for organisms that eat mosquitoes. And uh, a lot of these green infrastructures provide pollinating plants, which are really important for pollinators like bees. Also, there are some other insects, and there are bats that are pollinators as well. But the vast majority of our pollinators are bees. So putting in native vegetation that attract bees to help with pollination is another valuable ecosystem service. So green infrastructure. Rain gardens is a type of green infrastructure, as opposed to gray infrastructure. Gray infrastructure are like catch basins, pipes, culverts. It's all the things that are engineer, engineered and designed to keep water moving. Some of them can be designed to remove solids, but they're really designed to keep water moving. The green infrastructure, as soon as you're adding soil and vegetation, that helps to remove a lot of the pollutants. And so obviously today I'm going to be talking uh, exclusively on rain gardens, which is one of several types of green infrastructure. So a rain garden is essentially it's an excavated shallow depression planted with native vegetation to treat and capture surface runoff. And they're very flexible in terms of size and design and rates of infiltration. And the nice thing about them is, as opposed to a large uh, extended dry basin, these can be, accommodate very small lots. Uh, very frequently, it's an acre or less than an acre. Um, we work with a lot of um, uh, lake communities where you're talking about half of an acre, quarter of an acre lots where they're putting in these, um, these rain gardens into these situations to take care of the runoff on their property before it goes into the lake. And there's a little bit of semantics here. Rain garden typically refers to smaller systems. Uh, very frequently, they're the ones associated with private uh, property. 
And then when we, you hear the term bioretention or biofiltration, they tend to be the larger ones, and I'll show you examples of both. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're planting some deep-rooted native vegetation, um, perennials. Um, if, you, if it's a large enough um, uh, rain garden, you may have some trees in there. But really you want some hardy native vegetation that's going to tolerate the hydrologic variability, dry to wet, maybe tolerate road salt if we ever get snow again. Um, but also look at the removal rates associated with this. So TSS stands for total suspended solids. It's essentially dirt in the water. And TP stands for total phosphorus, 85% removal, which is really high. Nitrates, it's OK, it's about 30%. But those large basins, you're only talking about 20% removal for those pollutants. And the rain garden uses all four of those modes of stormwater treatment, settling, infiltration, chemical, biological. <clears throat> so when you're designing a rain garden, you really need a decent rate of infiltration. So you want that water not to sit there for a long period of time. You want it to, to move fairly quickly, you know, point inch per hour. Um, and you see at the bottom there, I says it, sh uh, it says it should drain within 12 to 48 hours. Some of the more recent literature says, oh, it has to drain within 24 hours because of mosquitoes. Well, the mosquito life cycle is about five to eight days from an egg to a mature mosquito. So I don't know why they're pushing that 24, but 12 to 48, you know, the average is around 24. If you can get 24 hours where the water is gone in about a day, you're getting a decent rate of infiltration and you're going to avoid having mosquitoes. If that water is pooling, that rain garden is not functioning properly. And the key to that is the mixture of the soil. So here you can see if you have a high clay content, and I know a lot of the soils around here, particularly around Lake Luxembourg, I know because I've, I've done some of the digging for some of the riparian planting we've done. There's a lot of clay in that soil. Um, it need, you need a mix of um, soil, which is like a, a decent amount of sand, uh, topsoil, and compost. So a nice mix, and we call that a loam. So uh, again, this is something I show the students a lot. If you have a sandy soil, it's majority of sand. If you have a lot of clay, um, you have the majority of clay. A loam is sort of a mix of sand, silt, and clay. That's what you want for a rain garden, a nice loamy soil. So it's going to allow the water to infiltrate down, but it's going to go slow enough that a lot of the pollutants are going to be absorbed. You don't want pure sand because the pollutants are just going to move right through. And that's why you want that loamy mix. It's that nice mix. If we were building, say, a wetland BMP, and we do a lot of those where you're designing a BMP wetland to remove pollutants, you would want the clay. If you want a wet pond BMP, you want clay because you want the water to sit there. With a rain garden, you want loam. You want that nice mix. And this is the, the triangle I show the students a lot. So in terms of where you want to be on the triangle, you want to be a loam sandy loam, so a nice, uh, a, a nice texture that allows that water to infiltrate down within 24 hours. Um, the design for the drainage, so usually when you're sizing a rain garden, from the size of the drainage area to the rain garden, it's about five to one, small. Uh, if we were doing a wetland BMP, that can get a lot larger. You can talk about 10 to one or even 20 to one. Um, the ponding of the water, so when the water's sitting there, it should only be about 6 to 12 inches. And again, it should be gone in about a day or two. Uh, the planting soil should be at least 18 inches deep. Um, but if you have trees or larger vegetation, you'd want that to be deeper. And the pH of the soil should be between you know, 5.5 and 6.5. The estimated cost. So, um, and I'll show you um, the president of our company actually installed one of his own uh, um, rain gardens. And, and um, you can go on our website and look at that blog, and he has a step-by-step -step process of how he did that. But a DYI, if you did it yourself, you know, the cost of a rain garden can be between $1 to $7 per square foot. If you have a professional come in to actually, you know, do the regrading, install the soil, and install the plants, it's probably between 10 to 15 per square foot. Some of these larger biofiltration systems, say for like a park, you're probably talking more $35 to $55 per square foot. Um, so these cost estimates, just keep in mind, they do not include any design work if you're having someone design it. 
and it doesn't include annual maintenance. And any, any BMP has some amount of maintenance. Now, the rain garden, the first year it has a decent amount of maintenance, but after that first year, it sort of uh, goes down to a minimum level. And here's the maintenance. So that first year, you may have to do some watering. Uh, usually the plants are very susceptible that first year, that if you get into a dry spell, you may need to water them. But it's one of the reasons why you want to use native vegetation. Native vegetation is familiar with this environment and ecosystem. So if it gets into a dry spell, it's a little more resilient against those dry conditions. But that first year, you may need to water it. Uh, you also might need goose netting or goose fencing. Uh, again, it's that first year. Once the vegetation is well established and the vegetation gets as high as your knees, the geese will let it alone. But if you just put the plants in, and you'll see some examples where the plants are just put in, and if you have problems with geese, it's, just, it's, it's a buffet. They'll just come and eat everything. So you may need to have some goose netting. Uh, there may be some weeding involved. You may get some invasive species, maybe some purple loosestrife coming in that you may have to remove. Uh, keep an eye out if you have a huge storm, some trash or some debris may accumulate. Um, if you have larger trees, you may have to inspect the trees once in a while, twice a year or something like that. Maybe do some cutting um, just to keep the system healthy and actively growing. And during an extensive drought, you may need to do uh, a little additional watering. But it's after that first year, once the plants are well established, the maintenance is pretty minimal. It's just keeping an eye on things, making sure invasives aren't coming in, picking up any garbage or trash or detritus that's accumulated in the rain garden. And in the rain garden, you'll have two or three different zones. This is really key in terms of selecting the vegetation. So at the bottom of the basin, uh, that's where you're going to have like wetland plants. You're going to have plants that are uh, more adapted to those wet conditions. And then as you go up the slope, you'll have plants that are a little less tolerant of wet conditions to the upland vegetation on the top. And um, I'm going to show you some of these, uh, some examples of some of the plants um, from the zones. And I can tell you that I got a lot of these from the Penn State um, educational program, Rain Gardens. And I noticed you have one of the flyers here that actually has a list of the plants that you would want. So just to go back, I just wanted to say that because if you're interested in more on these uh, plants that I'm going to talk about, there's a flyer out there that goes through more detail on what um, vegetation, what native vegetation you would like to install in your rain garden. So again, um, this is going to be an area that could be inundated with water for one to two days. So here we're talking about plants like elderberry, winterberry, blue flag iris, cardinal flower, swamp, uh, swamp milkweed, New England aster. And if you're talking about trees in the basin, well, you're probably talking about things like you know, black willow or swamp oak. Then you go up into that middle zone. You know, here's a small rain garden with a, um, with a red maple, a mist flower, broom sedge. And then the upper zone, you know, black chokeberry, um, witch hazel, um, butterfly weed, which is a great rate for pollination. So you have this zonation. And it's really important to select the plants you want for each zone so those plants are going to survive and, and, and do well. Um, where not to install a rain garden? Well, if you have a seasonally high water table um, within 24 inches of the soil's um, surface with little infiltration, that's not a good location. Uh, and very frequently, if you do put a rain garden in an area like that, you may have to import a large amount of soil, and that can drive the cost up of uh, the rain garden. You do not want to place a rain garden in an area that's constantly wet. If it's constantly wet, more than likely, it's a type of wetland. And wetlands aren't func don't, do not function like rain gardens. Wetlands sit there. They, they can remove pollutants. They can provide a, a, a evapotranspiration. They provide great habitat for fish and other aquatic life. But you do not want to put a rain garden into a wetland. The rain garden should completely drain within like 24 to 48 hours. Do not put a rain garden over a septic system, leach field, or tank. So if you are on septic, make sure you know where your tank is, where your leach field is. I, d I give a whole other talk on septic management, but you do not want your rain garden over that. And also keep your rain garden at least 10 feet away from the house or a structure. 
Matter of fact, uh, Jeff Gall, the president of our company, one of the reasons why he did a rain garden is he was having problems with water and his foundation. He wanted to get the water away from his building. So he did that using a, a rain garden. And then uh, and a lot of literature out there says that you, have, you really need to, you should, number one, contact the municipality for any sort of input or guidance they have, but then, you know, make the call, the PA1 call, for any utilities, any structures, anything that, you know, may uh, have an effect on that rain garden, and you certainly want to be safe. So a uh, PA1 call, you definitely want to do before you do any sort of digging. So I'm going to give you some examples of rain gardens, of biofiltration systems. So this is, this is Thompson Park in Jamesburg, New Jersey. This is part of a larger plan for the Manalapin Brook and Lake Restoration Plan. So it has a TMDL the way Lake Luxembourg has a TMDL. Its total maximum daily load is for phosphorus and total suspended solids. And one of the first projects we implemented on the plan was to install a biofiltration system. So um, this is the lake over here. Um, you can see the green um, oval is where we want to install the biofiltration system. This is what it looks like. And I always show photos like this to my students because I look at this and I'm like, why, do not, why, why don't they design parking lots with these islands? Why not design it so instead of having the stuff humped up, you have a cut in the curb, the water goes down and drains in. And that's exactly what we did here. So, you know, all this runoff, and you can see this was in winter. This is a good eight years ago. But look at all that salt left over on the road. And you can see on the far left the lake. So what we're doing is we're taking all the runoff from that parking lot and treating it before it goes into the lake. Um, so our engineers did the design work. So they did the design calculations to calculate during certain storms how much water is being generated because we need to calculate that to figure out the size of the biofiltration system. And you'll see a lot of them have under drains or they have ways that if you're, okay, it's going to treat maybe a two to 10 year storm event. But if we get a 50 or 100 year storm event or a hurricane, it has to have a way of keeping that water moving. We don't want flooding. So very frequently they're designed with under drains. So we worked with the uh, county um, parks and rec. They did all the, uh, the, the earth moving. Um, this was part of a, of a 319 non-point source pollution grant. Uh, we had volunteers from Rutgers help with the planting. Uh, the guy over to the uh, right, that's Clay Emerson. He is our senior technical director of engineering. Uh, and this was, one of, uh, th this was one of many projects that he's implemented. You can see the politician behind him because he has a tie on while he's planting. That's how you can always tell a politician is there planting. But see, look, look at the plants. There are these little plugs. You can imagine if a goose sees that, it's like it's dinner time. That is good eating. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of, and here you see the goose netting. Um, the goose netting is the black material on the edge, but you really can't see it. But there's also netting going across uh, as well. So geese are lazy. They would probably amble over and go in. But we put netting across just to deter them if they were thinking of flying in. But it did prevent them from eating the vegetation. Uh, we worked with Rutgers. We put a sign together. The sign explains what this thing is doing. It's cleaning water up before it goes into Manalapin Lake. It identifies the plants, explains why they're good for pollinators. And that's what it's looked like for the last 10 years or so. Um, I, as, as an aquatic person, so it, it, what I like about these projects is the engineers are involved, our wetland scientists are involved. I'm an aquatic person. I'm concerned about the lake. I go out to do the stormwater sampling, and you know, we, I went out three or four times, and I couldn't I didn't get any water, which is good and bad. It's good because it means all the water that during that, those storms that went into the rain, rain garden went into the ground. The bad news is I couldn't collect any water to say, oh, it, remo it removed 70 or 80 percent of the, of the nutrients. I could say 100 percent for those storms because no water was coming out. But it would have been nice to have something to compare. But very effective system, very minimal maintenance. Like I said, that first year, Parks and Rec had to do some watering, and they go in once a year and they remove some invasives, but minimal amount of maintenance and you know a variety of pollinators, and that's what it looks like. So it's been functioning great ever since. Um, 
This is, an, this is an example, again, another Jersey example, and then we'll go across the Delaware to, to PA, but this is a bioretention basin. Again, it's another park. This is the Hapakon State Park. Again, see how juicy that stuff looks like? It would look like to a, a goose. There's a lot of human activity at this park, so we weren't really worried about the geese getting in there. Um, so this is June of 2012, installed it, was really going great. Um, the, all the vegetation took off, so big state parking lot. There's the, the uh, inlet going into the bioretention basin, and you can see the lake in the background, so it's treating all that parking lot material before it goes into the lake. That's what it looked like in 2013. Looked great in 2015. And then I show up in 2016, it's like, what happened? It's like all of a sudden it's gone. Well, what happened was the, the public work crew who helped install this thing, a couple of the guys retired, and they didn't pass that institutional knowledge to the younger people. And they looked at that and the guy probably said, look at all those weeds. So they mowed it. <laughs> and it's like, really? And um, we went back and forth with the superintendent. And um, fortunately, in 2021, the super, a new superintendent came in, Melissa, and she understood what we were trying to do. She got some funding and put some, the, some vegetation back in. So we're back to be having a healthy bioretention basin. But uh, number one, it says why um, maintenance is important, but passing that institutional knowledge you know, to people who are going to be responsible for these is really important. And the other thing that's interesting is, you know, we had these little fences up, which I think was, were nice reminders for anyone to say, hey, let this alone, don't mow in there. And I noticed in 2015, those little fences were gone. And I think not having those fences there and having a new crew came in, they just came in and just, just mowed it. So again, something to keep in mind, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a rain garden in a public facility, municipal facility, something like that, to pass that knowledge on to others. This is um, Rutgers. So as part of a harmful algal bloom uh, grant that we just finished a few months ago, part of that grant we had a program where Rutgers would have a training class to show property owners how to install rain gardens. And you can see these are small lots. These are lake, this is a lake community. So you're talking about a quarter of an acre lot, you know, a third of an acre, tiny little lots. You can see how the homes are sort of right up against each other. But a couple of property owners actually installed rain gardens in their narrow lots to take the rooftop runoff and some of their sidewalk runoff and, and put it into these small little rain gardens with Rutgers, what they did is if you went through the training and you installed a rain garden and Rutgers looked at your rain garden and approved it, you could get up to $500 back reimbursed by installing that. So it was a pretty good program. We're probably going to keep it going for a number of years. So I'm going to go to Pennsylvania now. So this is, this is Harvey's Lake. This is up in Luzerne County, PA. Um, been working with Harvey's Lake for uh, since the, uh, as long as Lake Luxembourg, since the early 90s. But um, we had some issues there where they had some runoff, extra runoff coming from the municipal building and from some homes higher up that were really flooding this area right next to the lake. So we were looking a way of reducing that volume. So one of the ideas was, let's put a rain garden on the municipal property. Now, um, there were a lot of utilities on this site. I, this community is sewered. There were all sorts of other issues we had to deal with. So you can see that the shape of it is a little funky. It's, you know, it's that gray area right in the middle there. And uh, we had to shape it in a kind of peculiar way, number one. But also remember, we wanted to keep it at least 10 feet away from the uh, building. And this is what it looked like. And I like that shot on top because it's showing you the different zones that you need. Um, the biosoil mix, it's topsoil mixed with organic material um, and some additional construction going on. And that's what it looked like in May of last year. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like after a year. So um, the water go, will go through the vegetation and then you can see that drain. That drain is, you know, in case there's a large enough storm that um, you're more concerned about safety and flooding, that it's going to allow that water to go um, down into the pipe and it's not going to flood an area. But again, it's right next to the municipal building and that, was, that one was installed last year. And this is the one that I mentioned 
<clears throat> so the president of our company, Jeff Gall, and if you, go, if you, if you type Princeton Hy Hydro Rain Garden, you should get this. It's a really cool blog. He has 10 steps on him, and that's his, his wife, Amy. They built a rain garden. And, and the quote I like is he said, after repeated stormwater drainage issues near my home's foundation due to flat topography, he lives in Yardley, by the way, I opted to go uh, for the environmentally friendly route of installing a rain garden in my front yard. So he's installed that rain garden, basically taking that runoff away from his house and putting it into that structure. Uh, the, one of the last things I want to mention is, is biochar. So biochar is basically burnt wood material, has a high surface area, and it retains nutrients. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I've never used it in a rain garden. I've been using it since 2020 in lakes. Believe it or not, we put biochar in sleeves, and then we install it in lakes and ponds and stormwater structures, and it helps to remove nutrients to improve water quality. So we've installed them in small ponds, and then we see an improvement, less algae, because of the biochar. But um, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, DCNR, has a really good article on using biochar in rain gardens. So something to keep in mind. So in conclusion, you know, these rain gardens, smaller, biofiltration, bioretention systems, larger, they can be a very effective way of managing the quantity and uh, quality of the stormwater for these small to medium-sized drainage areas. Uh, you need a sandy, loamy mix with organic material. That's key for the infiltration to get the water into the ground. Use native vegetation. Try to put in some plants that require pollination. Don't forget to make the one call, and don't forget about maintenance. Very critical. Um, so that's what I have for rain gardens, and I thank you for your time. worked around Lake Luxembourg. Uh, what about the deer? Yeah, well, you know, I almost hit one coming down here, you know, from, from Del Val. I mean, it literally jumped out in front of me. Yeah, the deer, and, uh, is, the deer are a major problem, and that's something that I know we've talked to a lot of the state agencies um, in dealing with. I, I don't have any experience with the deer in this area. I know some of our Pocono clients have done deer culling, and that can get messy, and it has nothing to do with the deer. It has to do with, um, like, the SPCA, some, certain organizations that don't like that, you know, the deer or the geese are being culled. And, you know, deer can cause a lot of deforestation. They eat a lot of the vegetation. In terms of a rain garden, I don't know why. The wetland people tell me this. Deer don't like ivory soap. I don't know why, but I know when we do our restoration projects and we know there are a lot of deer, number one, we try to get species that the deer don't like, but you know, they like just about anything. The best thing to do is, uh, I don't know why, they, they don't like ivory soap. So like when we do our restoration projects, our, a lot of our wetland scientists are literally buying cases of ivory soap to tie it onto the trees. They don't like it. So, um, and like I was showing, in some of those park areas, the deer aren't as much of a problem because there's so much human activity, they sort of stay away. Um, but we had a very mild winter, which probably means there's going to be a lot more deer this year than previous years um, because we didn't have a, a nasty winter. So ivory soap, I don't know why. The bars, not, not the flakes, by the way. Just a comment. So the master gardeners um, that actually have their office at the old Grange Fair, um, they have a lot of natives. So if anybody's looking for them, their sales actually May 6th. Okay. So. Thank you. Is that a question up front? <laughs> I was wondering if you could, I'm not assuming that you're all private landowners considering for your yard. You said five to one ratio. So if they're looking at their house and a specific rain gutter that they're looking to divert, can you give a, a size? Like what, what would be typical for your, say, I don't know, 2,000 square foot house? You know, like what? Yeah, I'd say so. And directing water into your rain garden. 
Right. Um, so th this is sort of an extreme example, but when you look at the, the, um, the, these areas here, I think these rain, these rain gardens for the, um, uh, for, the, for the lake communities, they're only about 10 by 20 feet, so pretty small. And again, if, if you're looking at just doing a small portion, you can actually have, it's not a big deal to have an oversized rain garden. That, that's fine too. I mean, to be perfectly honest, if you're giving away a little bit of lawn, little more, you're giving away a little more lawn and adding more vegetation, number one, you can make it look attractive, and number two, it only helps to have it oversized. So definitely, if you're only looking at a rooftop and it doesn't have to be that large, but you have the land to make it larger, I would recommend making it larger. Assuming you did the one call, though, that's really important. So the examples that you gave, like in parks, seem really logical. Like it makes sense. It's draining off the, the parking lot, and you have the garden there before it gets into the lake. But what kind of scenarios would it work well for like in a residential situation? So that's in the case, like I said, you know, with Jeff and Amy, they just put it in their front yard. And it's just, it's almost like, um, it's almost like ornamental landscaping, but it has a function. Um, I'm from central PA, Shimokin, and where my parents live, across the street moved in a guy who is a teacher of the high school, and he teaches ecology and biology. And my dad was like, I don't understand. He ripped up his lawn and put this little, this little pocket thing in here. And I was describing to my dad, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a rain garden. I was explaining, and he's like, oh, OK, that makes sense. So I, I think you may get a lot of, what are you doing? Um, number one, if you can make it look attractive, people may not even think of it as a rain garden if you're doing it in a residential setting. It may, they may think of, oh, you're just doing landscaping. But it has a function and then educating people. Um, so I, I've seen quite a bit of residential people put them in, but they try to make them a little showier, number one. And number two, um, if you're familiar with Doug Ptolemy, the professor from Delaware, University of Delaware, he does a lot of research on suburban ecology, and he has this sort of rule of thumb that on your own, he goes, I understand people want landscaped plants, but you need to maximize native vegetation, if, especially if you want birds, you know, and birds eat insects, so it's nice to attract the birds. Uh, he has this ratio of 70 to 30, you know, have 70% of your plants being native, have 30% be attractive landscaping things you want. So I guess my uh, response would be try to make it look as attractive, especially if it's in the front. You know, if you can put in some nice colors and textures, it really goes a long way. We have landscape architects. I'm not a landscape architect. They handle all that sort of stuff. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, um, I liked that you put in the failure. So often when you watch a presentation like this, they show before and after, but they never show after, after, after. And the fact that you have to keep educating people yes. because your crew is going to change and just one person yep. can ruin in a day what you've put in in years, you know? So I really enjoyed that you put that in there. That was an important slide to me. Yeah, that, um, I'll tell you what, I've worked with a wide variety of public works crews, and nine times out of ten, they're great people. They, they, they're, they're out there because they like to be out there. They like the environment, but that I've seen, that you, know, you have the seasoned person who's been there for 10, 20 years, they retire, and that institutional knowledge has not been passed, and that's, that's really critical. Um, so you said for a rain garden that it needs to drain. Is it possible to incorporate like a pond into the concept of a rain garden? Huh, that's interesting. Um, there's something called a um, regenerative conveyance system, which is sort of like creating pools and riffles like a stream. We're actually designing a couple of those for New, uh, in New Jersey, where instead of just having a, you know, a swale, we're actually going to have pools, riffles, pools, riffles. Depending on your topography, maybe you could have a pond, and if the pond hit a certain height, 
because of a storm, then it spills into a rain garden. That might be possible. The problem with that is if the pond is anywhere on line with something, now you're dealing with permitting. If you have your own ornamental pond and it's a, literally a hole in the ground and it's connected to a rain garden, that might be okay, but if your pond is on line with some sort of waterway, all of a sudden that sort of triggers all sorts of permits. That's the only thing I'd be concerned about. Can you talk, since you mentioned swales, can you, can you talk about like other options besides a rain garden for um, stormwater? You know, and keeping it, so I live on a hill, um, so the road comes down to my house, my house goes down to uh, stuff behind, and uh, I imagine a lot of people around here have hilly situations. Yeah, so um, there are all sorts of green infrastructure. That's why I was like flashing back to here. Um, and so uh, you see at the bottom there, bioswales, um, very commonly implemented. Um, there, what you're doing is if you have an eroded gu gully, the, the concept is let's do some regrading and then let's plant some low-lying herbaceous vegetation. Maybe even putting in some check dams. Uh, and the only reason is you have like particulates accumulating behind the dams and then maybe once or twice a year you just go in and move that material. So a bioswale is a type of green infrastructure that would really help slow down the water so that you can collect the solids. You'd have, you know, we did uh, a couple of these bioswales um, for a community where they wanted Black Eye Susan. So instead of having these, these, these gullies, we regraded and then they had these nice bioswales going into their pond of Black Eye Susan. And so just, you know, any sort of those green infrastructure, you know, besides the, green gar the, the rain gardens, you know, the green roofs, which to be perfectly honest, the only place that we've done green roofs is in Philly. You know, that's where you'll see some green roofs done. But enhanced riparian areas, you know, naturalized infiltration basins, which are the larger basins, anything that you're putting in soil and vegetation. So a lot of the gray infrastructure, a lot of times I use gray infrastructure in, in lake communities because lake communities don't have a lot of space. And you can put like a multi-chambered baffle box system underground. And the states, well, Pennsylvania isn't, uh, they're okay with it. New Jersey always gives me a hard time. And they're like, well, we don't like spending money on gray infrastructure. And I'm like, yeah, but there's no room to put in green infrastructure, number one. And number two, again, the public works. They're easy to maintain. They're like, I know I need to come out twice a year with my vac haul. I lift up the chamber. I suck the material out. I know I can get 70 to 80% removal of the solids. I can get 30 to 40% removal of the nutrients. I can enhance it maybe with something with biochar, but at least I can get that. Um, if there's no room for green infrastructure, we'll go to gray infrastructure. But another green infrastructure we use a lot in lake communities are floating wetland islands. So these are material made of, uh, of recycled plastic material. It's anchored. We tend to put them near the shore where uh, like a swale or a pipe or a stream is coming in where that first flush of nutrients is coming in. And those floating wetland islands help to absorb a lot of the nutrients. So that's another green infrastructure where you may not have the room on the land to do it, but maybe you can do it in the water. So, but the bioswales are like a, a workhorse with green infrastructure, you know, because how many times you walk a property or you're walking in the forest and you see those gullies? You know, if you can regrade them and put vegetation in, that can really go a long way reducing the pollutant going into the receiving waterway. Mm hmm. I'm trying to address erosion. So. Yeah, and that's, that's a way to do it. I, again, especially. Again, I'm, assu I'm assuming it's a gully that dries out. Typically, there's no permit required for that. Now, if it's a flowing stream and you're thinking of doing some sort of like, you know, fluvial geomorphometry where you're doing all sorts of stabilization, you'll need permits for that. But if it's a gully, you know, bioswale can be an easy way to remedy that. Fred, our neighbors in Lower Maker have, have a program to build your own rain barrel. Okay. okay? Could you talk about the similarities and the differences between a rain garden, a rain barrel, and when you would want to use one over the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no that's, that's a good point. And matter of fact, today in the class, I was going over source control best management practices, and that was one of them, rain barrels. So a rain barrel is essentially a way of collecting the rooftop runoff, you know, typically a 55-gallon container. And what you do is you then use that water 
for um, non-potable -pot use. So you're using that water for landscaped vegetation. I wouldn't recommend using it for anything that you're going to eat, but you can use it for landscaping. So it's a nice way of collecting that water that otherwise goes into the stormwater infrastructure and can create issues associated with flooding and erosion and conveying of nutrients. It's better to hold that water and then use it to water vegetation. Not only are you helping your community and everyone downstream by reducing the amount of water leaving your property, you yourself can save money because now if you have some vegetation that you're concerned about watering, you don't have to turn on your faucet, you can actually use water that you've collected. Uh, rain barrels are very effective. I strongly recommend the ones that are covered because, you don't want, because a rain barrel would be the perfect habitat for mosquito. The uh, larvae, they, there's no predators, it's still water, it's perfect conditions, but if it's a capped rain barrel, you're good to go. So rain barrels are a really effective way of using that. And, you know, if you had a um, rain garden and you had a rain barrel, if you got to a drought, at least you'd have a way of using water. Um, if, say, the rain barrel was in the back of the house and your, and your rain garden was in the front of the house, and maybe the rain garden is focusing on collecting the runoff from the front of the house or from the driveway and parking lot, um, and then the back, you have this rain barrel just collecting other water, it'd be a way of augmenting that. So it, you can couple them. But yeah, it's a very effective way of reducing the source of the, of the issue, which is a lot of water going through those systems. I mean, we, we sort of take water for granted. I mean, I'm sure everyone known what's been going on in California where, you know, they were in an extreme drought and now they've gotten so much rain. We're just so used to getting rain on a very regular basis. We, we, take, we take it for granted compared to out west. I w did my graduate work out west and um, there was a lot more stormwater storage out west. Um, because they're afraid after April, we're not gonna see rain till November, so we gotta have as much water as we can. So uh, rain barrels are definitely a, another way of, of addressing a, a, an individual's lot's impact associated with stormwater. You, you mentioned non-potable water with a rain barrel. So are you saying that you shouldn't use it to to water a vegetable garden? I wouldn't. Just, I wouldn't. And why not? Well, unless I because, tested Because, I mean, it. naturally the rain, so say you have a garden, a vegetable well, garden, I, and rain comes down, you hope it rains, so you're not out there watering. So I don't know what's coming off the roof. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And so um, what you could do is just have it tested. Like if, and, and if you know, you know, uh, if your roof, if you know what the material is, and you've had it tested, then by all means you could use it. But I'm just saying, if, if I don't know, what's coming off that roof and I haven't right. tested it. Personally, I wouldn't use it for that, mm -hmm. uh, for a vegetable garden, but that, you know, that's just me. Um, again, you can have it tested, and if you test it and it's fine, then uh, you could use it for that. I wouldn't, I still wouldn't drink it though. Oh, of course uh, not. No, yeah, no, no, no. but yeah. Well, again. I have a well where I live, I mean, not too far there from we here, go. So, so that's a whole nother yep. story. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and yeah. especially if you have a newer roof, you know, newer yeah. roof, you know, the material that's being leached, isn't as nasty as, as older roofs, if you have an older house. Or old slate have... roof or something like that. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's the only reason. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the major streams in these two watersheds that are in Middletown are designated as impaired. And you mentioned the TMDL. I'm not sure everybody understands what that is. Could you explain it a little sure, bit? Sure, sure. So a TMDL stands for total maximum daily load. The reason why it's daily is because TMDLs were originally designed for point source pollution. So stuff coming out of like a discharge pipe. And they were focused on daily loads. They use TMDLs also now for like lakes and streams and rivers. But most of the time we're looking at a TMDL over a year. So um, the simplest way to describe a TMDL is if my existing pollutant load is here and the TMDL based on modeling says I need to get here, you need to have a, you want a restoration plan that shows you how to get from point A to point B. I always like to say it's like putting your lake on a diet. And for me, I'm a, I'm a lake scientist. I do a lot of limnology and a lot of lake management and restoration. 
Lakes are a lot easier than streams because a lake, you can link, say, phosphorus. If I have this much phosphorus, I have algae blooms. If I go down here, I won't have as much algae blooms. It will improve the clarity of the water. So it's a very easy thing to convey where rivers, um, rivers have TMDLs, and obviously you want good water quality, but a lot of times it's not as, as simple as that. A, a river or a stream is a lot more dynamic and complex. And people who live around lakes, their property value is directly associated with the quality of that water. It can be like that with rivers as well, but it, it tends to be a lot more complex. But a TMDL is essentially putting a waterway on a diet. You're here and you want to get to here. It could be phosphorus. You know, it could be suspended solids. It could be some other pollutant. It could be oxygen demand. So a lot of rivers uh, up in North Jersey, it's, it's oxygen demand, trying to get the trying to get more oxygen in the waterways during the base flow when there's not a lot of water moving through. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what a TMDL does. But we try to link the TMDL to a management plan. And the management plan will say, we want to do all these projects to get from here to here. Uh, and the, you know, the restoration plan for Lake Luxembourg, it's not that old. It's about five years old. Matter of fact, I'm re we're reviewing it going through the projects to see what could be done you know, in the future for Lake Luxembourg, you know, beyond the conservation pool that's being worked on right now. Any more questions? Sure. It's Go for more it. or less maybe for you or to the... I, I live at the bottom of the hill okay. and on the corner a lot and the easement, the uh, rainwater easement is on my property. So I can't grow anything taller than four feet. And they're currently putting in sidewalks and I'm worried about more water rain coming on the property. Uh, is this something I could work with the township to figure something out for the, because the corner has the, um, the uh, community sign also. So is that something I could work with the township to create something? I would say yes. So what I would do is do a rough sketch, talk to whether you call or come in one day and talk to the building and zoning people and just say, this is my situation and give it, a, you know, work with them. They understand your issue and hopefully they can, you, we can come to a compromise and work it out. Yeah, I, and just <clears throat> to follow up on that, nothing to do with ordinances or easements, but something that we've used in the past are called, um, they're called tree boxes or filtera systems. So very frequently they're installed on the edges of curb. It's a drop inlet so that the water goes in, the solids settle out, and then the water goes into a box which essentially has a tree in it. And the tree absorbs the nutrients. So um, I have no idea if that would work in this setting or not but it's just something in situations like that we have used uh, in similar situations. Don't know if it would be applicable or not, but that's something that's been used to uh, alleviate that type of situation. Any other questions, folks? Okay. Fred Lubno from Princeton Hydro, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So as Fred mentioned, mentioned before, there are handouts out there. Some of you already took them. Please feel free to take them. I do want to do some blatant marketing right now. Saturday, April 29th is our big ass Earth Day event over at Core Creek Park, okay? Master Gardeners, Watershed People, our Environmental Advisory Council, not only from Middletown, but lower, uh, Lower Make, Falls Township, everything else like that. We have inflatables for the kids and everything else like that. So environmental, yes, and a lot of fun for the kids. It is World Tai Chi Day, so bring your black garb, pajamas and do Tai Chi there from 11 to 12 or something like that. So um, my card is also out there. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a buzz. We recorded this, we'll put it on the website, give it a, seven to 10 days. Uh, Fred is also kind enough to share the PowerPoint, so that will be on the website as well, okay? If you're here and you didn't register, you could register tonight 
and then this way uh, you'll be on the email list and you'll, you know, you'll get the notice that everything happened, okay? So I do thank you so much for coming out tonight. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you.